Channel 5. Uh, my great detention center. Uh, detention camp. Yo, before I start the video, I want to let you guys know what we finished tonight on my channel. I twitched that heavy slash Johnny Boy G. This is the artwork right here. If you guys want to see more of this, check it out. My streams. I stream uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and the weekend. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, enjoy the video. Camp. Sorry, not center. Uh, we saw a part of this on the last two weeks, a week ago. Video. No, that's about, I think it was three weeks actually. Um, how. They went to a certain area in Texas, I believe. Yeah, it was in Texas. And because it shut down a certain border. And there is a place where people are still crossing over. They're bringing hold around the around the uh, wall. And I guess they, this one guy came. He was like an alien Air 51 guy, possibly <laughs> coming back. Uh, Who says they're holding people in like. Like between two porta potties and they're just sitting there it's like i don't know it's a weird thing man but let's find out sonoran desert hidden behind border patrol vehicles and makeshift tents were hundreds upon hundreds of migrants all of whom who hopped the u.s mexico border in the past couple hours it was a shocking sight to see people from all around the world herded like cattle on the cold desert floor sitting in silence awaiting an uncertain future <laughs> despite these conditions spirits are generally high <laughs> because most of these people have traveled days weeks and even months just to get here about three quarters of them are single males but there are also many children America is at a breaking point with record levels of illegal immigration. These people's lives are at the center of the national conversation, but they could care less. They are, They've man. finally made it to the land of opportunity, a nation allegedly founded upon the principles of liberty and radical individuality, where anyone from any walk of life can make something out of themselves. I guess they call them detainees. They've been walking on this road. This road runs for 12 miles, 12 or 13 miles. Damn. What it does is it parallels our border fence. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, on the Mexican side of it, is Mexican Highway 2. Mm -hmm. So the cartels have a really easy job. They just bring the people off of Highway 2 mm -hmm. and then through the wall. The wall is, has many of those cuts that I told you about earlier yeah. where they run the people through. And so the, the immigrants just walk down this road. Right, so as you guys can probably see right here, that's a group of five migrants who just hopped the border and they're walking directly into Border Patrol custody to join the seated group of migrants that we just encountered. Those so like, typically when you think of the border, stay. at least me personally, I thought it was like people hop and then try to evade Border Patrol and make their way to a, a large U.S. city to yeah, start a new life. In but in this case, you can see they are putting themselves directly in the custody of Border Patrol to begin the asylum seeking process. Like they're not trying to uh, evade or anything. A border patrol agent agreed to speak with us, but didn't want to go on camera. Normally, agents are not allowed to be interviewed, and all press requests are typically deferred to a public information officer who rarely ever responds. But in this instance, the agent seemed exhausted and eager to tell me what was going on. Damn. No, there's very few of them evading. How come? Well, because they allowed them in. They don't evade because they'll let them come in. They'll. They load them in the vans, they take them up to Phoenix, give them a $3,000 gift card and a cell phone and send them wherever they want to go. You get a court date, you have two years to show up in court. That's the reason I give them a phone because they're saying if, you, if they don't give me a phone, I don't know when I'm supposed to go to court. So they give them a phone. At first, I was confused what the Border Patrol agent what? meant when he kept referring to they. To the naked eye, it appears that Border Patrol is the one handling and processing the migrants, but they're only the first step what? in a chain of bureaucratic authority that goes up to the department. Uh, did you see the Texas kick uh, Border Patrol out of Texas border using the National Guard? No, wait, what? Political content? Okay, I understand. I said I don't want to do a lot of political stuff. But it's about my migration, all right? It's not like going with like the whole uh, other stuff, all right? <laughs> like, it's limited. I said I would never do it. I'm just going to more limit it, all right? We've already been through like two videos on this already, so I might as well finish it. That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing right now, all right? <sighs> all right. Like, th that's, all I'm, that's all I'm doing, all right? Uh, I said I'll do some, but not all. <laughs> Florida governor sent their National Guard to reinforce them. I wonder if they're going to update with this one because this one just uploaded today. 
or yesterday. Department of Homeland Security, then finally, up to the Department of Justice's Executive Office for Immigration Review, which is more or less controlled by the Biden administration, who've taken a much more open arms approach to immigration after pulling back Title 42 just about a year ago. But despite pushing for more lax border laws in comparison with President Trump, the wall just got 10 feet taller, believe me. Biden hasn't done anything to make the process of applying for citizenship any faster. In fact, it still takes between 18 to 24 months to get a response on a citizenship application. And it's really? actually possible to be denied citizenship if you fail to memorize and regurgitate fun facts about the history of America. How many amendments does the Constitution have? It has 27 amendments. Good. Which group of people was taken to America? And Bro, I'm an, I'm an American. I don't know how many amendments or, or how many presidents we had, man. I'm stupid as fuck. Oh, uh, luckily I was born here. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Sold the slaves? Uh, Africans. Good, excellent. So it makes sense why a lot of migrants, many of whom are facing desperate circumstances, avoid the citizenship application process altogether. I wonder if my great great grandparents. Well, my parents actually got a uh, citizenship here. Um, I don't know if it's an exact green card, but it's like a like a, a permission kind of thing. Was they gotta like keep renewing like every I'll say like every five years or so like sort of like a license kind of thing, um, but they here legally. My parents did like a long process, but again they did it like when there was like long t longer time when it was like when it was like a less crisis I guess you could say, uh, compared to what it is now. Um, but yeah, like for them it took them a long long process for them to like get here like be here yeah. Uh, no no it's not a work visa it's something else because my mom doesn't work. It took my grandma decades to get. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It took her like decades. Like, I forgot what it is. It's a, it's a different kind of citizenship. Um, I don't know what it is exactly. It's not a work visa. No, it's something else. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's like kind of like a permission kind of thing, where like it's very hard for them to get uh deported. I guess something like that. Per yeah, I think that's what it is. I think that I think that's permanent resident status. I think I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's not a work visa. I know that for sure. Cause as work visas, uh, uh kind of like I want to work here in this state of like, or I've been hired and yeah, uh, work visa to work here for this many years. You know, like because the company wants to hire me or something, right? Who were economic refugees that fled Ireland in the wake of the potato famine? Oh fan. no, no. Experience. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, I see. Asian refugees were given permanent resident status. Uh, so they, they thought they were citizens? No, 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 it doesn't work like that, no. Got deported? Yeah, uh, let me see, this is it right here. Uh, a permanent resident is a person who has the legal right to live in a country or territory on a permanent basis, even though they are not citizen of that country. Yes, I think this is what it is. I think this is what my parents have right here. Next day, the permanent resident, as I call a lawful permanent resident, LPRs are known as green card holders, permanent resident aliens, resident permit holders. So this is like the difference, right? Permanent residents, and this is like green card, right? Because green card, you become a, a, an official U.S. citizen. A permanent resident is like you have permission to be here for good unless you uh, break the laws or some shit like that, right? <laughs> like... But the ones where uh, fighting on thin against got deported? Really? What the f Such an arduous process when they arrive to America. Also, the reason why I'm watching this video too is because uh, my parents had to like go through s this stuff like this as well. And some of my family members still are going through this as well right now. So that's why I'm not really watching this. Unlike these migrants who arrived at the southern border, my family arrived on boats to Ellis Island 115 years ago. Much like Roberto and Alberto, who we interviewed in our previous episode, Arizona Border Crisis, they found themselves in a strange Arizona, new sorry, land with sure. pennies to their name. They had no particular plan, but what they did have was the willpower and determination to work as hard as they could with the hopes of one day providing a brighter future for their family. And it worked. And that's all thanks to Grandpa Jerry, who died 30 years before I was born. I wonder if he was asked who Paul Revere was. 
or what the Boston Tea Party was all about. Was there a concern back then that these migrants weren't American enough to join our society? Or is that way of thinking a new phenomenon driven by the paranoia of a white minority? An analysis of census data from the Brookings Institute projects the number of white Americans will fall below 50% for the first time ever in about 20 years, 2045. Or perhaps it's less about race and more about the burden of inheriting global poverty when we have so many problems of our own. I guess times have changed a lot too. It's yeah. not like there was fentanyl or cartels back then. And most immigrants plan to move to America forever, not stack up money here and go back home. I don't have the answers, but I do have a lot of questions. One question in particular, how can we as Americans expect to propagandize the entire world with our dream through Hollywood, the music industry, and the testimonies of self-made American billionaires while simultaneously exploiting the labor, crops, and raw earth materials of developing nations, freezing the economies of our political opponents through trade sanctions, and creating rival drug cartels with our insatiable appetite for cocaine, fentanyl, meth, and heroin and not expect a global economic refugee crisis at the southern border. But that being said, no matter where you stand on illegal immigration, I think we can all agree that our system as it currently stands is broken. We have a we have a legal process for 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 immigrants and and it's my it's green green by card. some but it's it takes forever. I hate it in my right shoe so for safekeeping. <laughs> I even made up a Oh my god, that's that's being cut. Oh my god sped up for those mm -hmm. those with skills and those who want to come and build skills and and be americans and be proud to be here and work and better their lives and their families and the treacherous journey that they have to take I, I across like the border and through like the desert time, you're losing lives that way and so uh i just uh, hope in 2024 we can rectify this problem and help those who want to get here legally. It appeared that all of the migrants who were walking directly into Border Patrol's hands were approaching from a westbound road called Puerto Blanco Drive, a narrow dirt pathway running through the national park. So I decided to drive down the road to see if I could find some migrants to speak to. First, we see some signage warning us of what's to come. Truthfully, I don't expect to see much, but as I continue down the road, they seem to be spawning out of thin air from all angles. Most of them in a rush, we're told, because their cartel coyotes told them they had to get to the Border Patrol facility by nightfall in order to be transferred to a larger processing center or dropped off in a major city. But I notice a group of a few of them walking pretty slowly, so I call them over to the car to see if they want to talk. How you guys doing? Where are you guys from? Senegal. From Senegal? How you got, you're in America, how does it feel? What's the, what's the plan? Tradition, traducteur. Okay. Ah ouais, du camping américain. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Can you guys tell me about your life in Senegal? How was your life in Senegal? Trans oh, translator. How are you guys doing? Welcome to the United States. Where, where are you from, man? Senegal. Senegal. You guys are all from Senegal? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Do you speak any English? Uh, a little. Oh, cool. So how was your guys' life in Senegal? So the life in Senegal is very, very hard. You know? mm -hmm. Chaos and unrest in Senegal once again. The opposition leader urged supporters to take to the streets to protest against his jail sentence. The government, the political government is, uh, is bad. But the opposition are very difficult uh, to, to, to manifest her, 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 her problem. We are here. Uh, to, 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 to get another life for our family, yeah. for our people. We are very tired in Senegal. Senegal is very hard. That's why we, we come here uh, to, to get another life. No? Yeah. Yeah. The, the American people is a good, is a good people. Yeah. You know, they are democracy, they are, they are, they are good life. You know? what, what kind of work? That's not necessarily true, but I understand where it's coming from, right? I mean, American people are not like 100% great. I mean, obviously we all have our bad people in every every single place, you know? Uh, here we have Karens and Kevins. I'm sorry. What do you want to do? Me? Mm -hmm. uh, I am. I was a soldier in Senegal. Mm -hmm. I, I do two, two years in the army, you know? After my two years, I, I was a, a, a security private. No. In security. security. Yeah. Okay. Security cool. So you're gonna look for some a security job. Don't know. Oh yeah. yeah. Hey man. Yeah. Well, best of luck, man. I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Hope everything goes well. Okay. See you guys later. See you, man. Thanks for talking to us. Yeah. See you guys. Bye guys.
After stopping to speak for a bit, the group of Senegalese men headed westbound toward the border patrol facility. We, however, kept driving. As you continue to drive along the border wall, you can see people popping out from under the wall in a specific part of the fence that's being guarded by an SUV on the Mexican side. Oh, damn. Nearby, I see a group of mothers and children who appear to have recently just crossed the wall. They tell me they're migrants from Michoacan. The mother of these children, who personally financed their trip, says she's willing to talk to me. My question is, how was your life in Mexico? It's very cruel. There's a lot of assaults, the only reason why I don't like my dad going back to Mexico, like, I don't like my dad going to Mexico, honestly. I just really don't. Um, he's in an area where it's not that crazy, but it's like literally right next to a town where it is crazy, you know, which is not even that far. So, yeah, because Mexico, man, it's just, it's just, it's always like just bad and cartels and, oh God, it's just, yeah. Es muy pobre? Sí. ¿Por qué quieres ir a los Estados Unidos? Porque como le comenté, estamos huyendo de la delincuencia y para un futuro para mis hijos. ¿Qué quieres para tus hijos? Pues que estudien allá. ¿Hoy es tu primera vez en los Estados Unidos? Sí, sí. es la primera vez. ¿Y qué piensas? Pues que pues echarle ganas con mis hijos y sí. sacarlos adelante y no... Pues sacarlos de la violencia. ¿Hay mucha violencia? Sí, mucha. Por la gente que andan pues así, como robando, quitando a los niños y todo. ¿Pero es peligrosa para los niños también? Sí, es peligroso. ¿Qué tipo de trabajo pre prefieres? Pues yo dependí de un trabajo que sea un robo y todo. ¿Y tienes uh, planes para asilo? Sí, tengo para, para eso vengo, para que me den apoyo. ¿Qué, si ¿Qué significa asilo? Pues que ayudan a las personas con los niños que vienen de, de México para acá. ¿Es una proceso fácil? Pues yo digo que sí. Uh -huh. Y vas a sola hablar con la amiga y decir yo tengo problemas en mi país. Sí. Así es. Sí. ¿Tienes una ciudad que quieres ir? A California. ¿California? ¿Qué, sí. ¿qué ciudad en California? Uh, Victorville. I know that place. I've uh -huh. been there. ¿Tienes familia en Victorville? Sí, tengo sí. familia. ¿Fue tan caro el viaje? Sí. Actually, Victorville is not that expensive. It's actually a bigger wasteland over in Victorville. I, was, I, I don't know how much it changed there, but yeah, I think Victorville is actually more realistic. Unless she's not staying in Los Angeles, Orange County, like those places do not come. If you're coming from overseas, do not go to those places. They're very expensive. They're very violent still, by the way. Uh, but Victorville is much more calm. It's more of a wasteland. I could be wrong. I'm not fully educated in Victorville, but uh, that I remember is more affordable. Fue caro. ¿Cuánto? 10, 10 mil. 10 mil para cada persona o todo? Para los viajes y más aparte que nos piden. 12. 12. Sí, cada persona. Necesitas trabajar para un año para eso, ¿sí? Sí. ¿Y tienes uh, miedo de deportar? Pues sí tengo. Sí. Pero no, no sabes ahora si eso es en tu futuro. Pues no sé. So, Dependiendo ya de que esté allá con la migra, ellos dicen. De... ¿Qué piensas sobre la migra? Pues yo pienso que nos van a ayudar, ¿no? Para eso vamos. Que ojalá nos ayude. Yeah. Cuando tú fuiste joven, ¿tienes sueños de los Estados Unidos? Pues sí, sí tengo sueños. ¿Por qué? Pues porque... Pues dicen que hay mucho trabajo bien y todo. ¿Piensas que todas las personas en México quieren ir aquí? Yo digo que sí. Okay. ¿Qué piensas? <laughs> okay, muchas gracias. Sí. Hasta luego. Sí. Sí. Midway through my shoot, I had an interesting revelation. It seemed that almost every migrant of Latin American descent, particularly Mexican that I talked to, said they were leaving their hometown because of threats from gangs or being kidnapped by the cartel. Do you know how, do you know how they recruit cartel members for overseas? They kidnap you. They force you. Not all, but they do that. that and they also recruit kids as well to do their, their stuff. That's how cruel they are. That's how uh, heartless they are. They don't care. As long as they bring them money. They'll threaten to kill all your family. They don't join them too as well. Like I, I remember this one story that we saw. I believe it was on Netflix. The one that they. Uh, again we don't know if it's true. But it was like the documentary about. Like, like surviving the toughest prisons. And one of them was like close to Mexico. And one of them said like. Uh, he was forced to smuggle drugs from Mexico to the United States uh, because 
the way they forced them is like they they had like a line of guys and said, "Would well, you smoke a joint?" And the guy said, "No." They killed the guy next to him. Like the guy, the guy who got killed said no. And so when they asked him, "Do you want do you do you want to smuggle drugs for us now?" And he had to say yes. Like, what are you supposed to say? No, and get killed. You know, it's like it's insane, man. In our previous episode, Arizona border crisis, we spoke to two different migrants, Alberto and Roberto, who reported similar stories. Por los carteles nos sacaron, nos sí. sacaron de las casas. ¿Qué ciudad de México habías? En Veracruz. Entonces que gobierna el cártel de Jalisco. Sí. Sí, pues te piden cota y como si no tienes dinero, ¿de dónde les vas a dar? Sí. Y pues te sacan de tus casas. Que somos el grupo Matacetas. Y estamos amenazados que no podemos regresar. Hay mucho movimiento de eso, de las drogas y todo. Sí. Muy feo. However, many locals and law enforcement personnel believe they're being disingenuous when they make these sorts of claims, because applying for asylum requires the proof of persecution or imminent danger. During the asylum-seeking process, it's typically not enough to declare that you're simply poor and looking for a better life elsewhere. You have to provide ample justification that it's actually dangerous for you to stay in your hometown or your home country. And even then, many claims are rejected. And so claiming that the cartel is personally after you is a really easy way to be granted asylum, especially because there's no real intelligence apparatus to confirm or deny the authenticity of this threat. The concerned citizen of mysterious origin who we met at the Arizona border last episode claims that cartel coyotes that control the human smuggling route around the Lukeville Gringo Pass area are coaching these migrants in how to explain themselves to press and border patrol oh, agents. The cartel or somebody is coaching them because they virtually say the same thing. Oh, that their, their lives are in danger from gangs in these areas and they've been threatened with kidnapping and we've even found a notebook um, that had those kind of answers written down as if the person was rehearsing these statements mm -hmm. to say when they were you know when they confronted the border patrol to be honest, this made perfect sense to me. I'm not for a second dismissing that narco violence has had a significantly negative impact on the civilian population of Mexico, especially in places like Ciudad Juarez, where hundreds of women have been found murdered for no apparent reason. But I found it difficult to believe that cartels were systematically kidnapping local children in their own communities and squeezing their non-affiliated, already struggling parents for ransom pesos. It seemed like they had bigger fish to fry, like supplying the open-air trank market of Philadelphia or the fentanyl market of San Francisco. That being said, even if these migrants were lying or at least greatly exaggerating the cartel threat, they've still gone to extreme lengths to reach the United States. So their situation back home was obviously pretty hopeless. If anything, it's more sad that they have to present their situation in this way in order to be able to engage our immigration courts. However, some people, like the gentleman we interviewed, believe even the poverty they claim to come from is also a lie. The part that alarms me, what you used to see, you know, 10 years ago. Has he gone to Mexico? Has he seen Mexico? Bro, have you seen the photos that my, brother, uh, that my dad sent? Bro, this guy, oh my god, he's one of those uh, people. It's gotten better, I'll give it that, but bro, poverty in Mexico, man. Bro, this guy, oh my god, no, 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 no. What? I, 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 you know what I'll even do, if it's possible? I'll even ask my dad if he could bring back photos uh, around the era that he lives in Mexico. And let's see how, like, how he really thinks. <laughs> so you would find these cheap Chinese made camouflage backpacks that were purchased by the crossers in these border towns and they would get across the border. The backpacks would invariably break or something like that. Now we're finding these Louis Vuitton leather backpacks. We found one just the other day that was lying on the ground. We opened it up in the top compartment. There was a bottle of cologne and a UCB C cord. Neck pillows. This is a different demographic completely. I decided to walk through the Sonoran Desert to see if what the man was saying was true by inspecting backpacks. I see that because uh, they throw uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, I believe the things they don't sell to keep it more exclusive. But we saw this in a different video where they slashed those kind of products. And I, I thought it's not out of, out of ordinary if they actually like they throw away those products and out of trash or whatever or something like that or send them somewhere else. So am I that surprised? Not really.
Because it, and there's also another thing too where like it could mean uh these products could be worth a lot somewhere in this place or it could be worth less in other places too as well. But we have seen that like they do slice those kind of products or they throw them away it's so they could keep the the brand name more exclusive still. Left behind by migrants. You guys, guess what it is? USB-C charger. Ugh. Shh. Staying fresh. Another luxury item. Yeah, this is a, it's kind of like a passport. It's an international certificate of vaccination stamped from the Republic of Guinea. Let's see what else is in here. Oh, and lo and behold, the aforementioned, totally authentic Gucci slipper. We spoke to this gentleman oh, earlier, if you guys remembered, who mentioned that these migrants, unlike the old migrants, are bringing like luxury items like Gucci purses, Louis Vuitton flip-flops. Louis Vuitton! Prada bags and stuff like that. And so as you can see here, someone has left behind a, a Gucci slipper, but as you can see, it's not actually Gucci. It says on the heel right here, yeah, Zaza. Zaza. <laughs> Obviously in America, Zaza is a type of weed. Zaza, with Zaza. Where's Zaza? Zaza. 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 the best weed in Florida. Best weed ever, well. Come on now. We don't bullshit. But internationally, I would assume it is a, a variant knockoff of Gucci with the pattern, it's which really leads good. to another theme, which is the mass production of knockoff luxury and designer goods in the third world. I don't know if you guys have been to Vietnam uh, or yeah, Nigeria yeah, before, yeah. but place is fucking Gucci down. Another thing I noticed along the border fence were blue flags and water stations that were placed every quarter mile on the way toward the border patrol facility. Yes, yeah, so as you guys can see, pretty much all along the border fence, like this entire way, every quarter mile or so, you'll see these giant blue flags. I'm not sure who puts them there, but they're basically what I'm assuming to be emergency medical services. They have a, like a, a giant thing of water right here. So if you want to get some water, you can obviously oh, get some water and shit. They have cups here. Upon further research, these tanks of water and flags are left behind by humane borders, aka Fronteras Compasivas, an Arizona-based nonprofit that sets up hundreds of water stations along the border oh, to provide the... hydration to migrants, Damn. which in the summertime, as temperatures can rise to above 120 degrees in the desert, can be a matter of life or death. People dying out in the desert. They were dying because they didn't have any water. So the next day I read another article about this. Two people dying because they didn't have any water. So the third day, it was a mother and a daughter that died out here in the desert Damn. because they didn't have water. So I got pissed off. I said, I have to do something seven days a week. We're out here in the field putting out water for the migrants. If you're interested in donating, please go to humaneborders.org slash donate. Last year alone, nearly 100 migrants died crossing the border in that five mile section where we filmed this video. And the sheer number of migrant deaths that occur in the Arizona desert as a whole, solely as a result of dehydration is staggering. This in mind, 75% of migrant deaths big, happen in the summer months. Trip. So it's no surprise the winter months of December and January see the highest migrant traffic by a large market. What's up, right there? Not very much. Where are you coming from? Yeah, I'm from West Africa. Oh shit. From Guinea, you know? West yeah. Africa? Yeah, it's no easy ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by God and power, you know? How, how, Respect. How, yeah. long, how long has your journey been so far? Oh, though, nothing to say. Mm -hmm. That's fucked up, though. How'd you get to Mexico? Oh, yeah, so, <laughs> let me, uh, so let me drink some a lot of water fresh mm -hmm. after that so we can talk, okay? You want some water? Yeah. We got some, some brother. We got some. How long ago did you leave Guinea? It's been a two week. I live okay. in Guinea. Le Guinea, mm -hmm. Guinea. Mm -hmm. uh, after Guinea, so Senegal, Dakar. To take to the plane to go Istanbul, uh, 28 hours to his car. Then Istanbul to Bogota, Bogota, San Salvador, San Salvador, Nicaragua. So you pick up the car mm -hmm. to go to the borderline to God, Nicaragua God. and wow. Honduras. Mm. You know, then you go to immigration Honduras just to take to, to, to take one paper. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, then. Take a bus, bus, uh, Honduras, Honduras, yeah, Guatemala, you know. Guatemala, Mexico. Mexico, the cop is Mexico, is fucked up though. The cops? Yeah, my bro, damn. Like the Mexican oh, border patrol. Mexican boy, yo, I spending, I spending uh, $5,000. They extorted you? Yeah, this, yeah, though. The guy is taking me my watch, my heart, in my airport, you know, because I don't have the money, man, you know, in my pocket. I use my car. 
Yeah, my bank, mm -hmm. my, my, my car bank, you know. So you finally made it to Mexico, and then what happened? They finally Mexico. Yeah. Uh, we took a, a one 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 bus to go yeah, uh, Chapachula. Mm -hmm. Chapachula is too far. But it's not then, but yeah, not yeah Chapachula. We took a one bus again to continue to uh, Ariaga. Ariaga yeah, again. We took a taxi, the yellow car, mm -hmm. yellow car. Then bike, bike, uh, horse, mm -hmm. horse to the three cycles bike. Mm -hmm. After what? that. Shujitan. Bro. Then after uh, Shujitan, Mexico City. Mexico City. Wow. We go to the bus station Crazy. to buy a ticket. Why? We take a bus is again. 1,070 miles from bus in Mexico City. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 2,070 yeah. miles. And you ended up near here. Two days and the bus. Mm -hmm. You know. Then when you arrive there, yeah. so I make it two days because. I met the Spanish, uh, the Mexican girl, and to the bus station. Oh my she God. got so much love for me, bro. Yeah, yeah she oh followed me, and, and that was the first, that to the first meet. This is the Mex Mexico bus station. You know, you know her baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to drink one oh beer. Oh my again, God! Bro. You know, it's <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh damn. I thought they Back. Didn't steal the phone. <laughs> It's not easy, but thank God. So what's your what, what's your plan now, bro? <laughs> it's my plan to the next episode yeah. after uh, after this uh, uh, these things, but difficult to explain it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but doesn't God power? <laughs> As the sun began to set and oh, darkness approached, we figured it was right. safer to go back to the border patrol facility. When we returned, migrant population had doubled and spirits were considerably lower than they were in the early afternoon when we first arrived. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Tienes hambre? ¿A dónde eres? Soy de de Guatemala. Sí. Sí. ¿Estás bien? Sí. ¿Qué pasa, mi amigo? Tengo hambre. Sí. Sí. ¿Cómo fue tu viaje? Está mal. Estoy muriendo de hambre. Solo hago unos cantantes. ¿Quieres comida? Sí. Okay. Yo tengo. We have food in the car, right? Sí. Some food at least, right? Sí. ¿Qué es tu nombre, amigo? Miguel Yat. Miguel Yat. Miguel Yat. ¿Cuántos años tienes? Tengo 34. Sí. Sí. ¿Tienes hijos o hijas? Sí, tengo. Tengo hijo. Tengo cuatro. Son seis mis hijos. Tres varones y tres mujeres. ¿Y ellos viven en Guatemala? Damn, sí, dude. vivo en Guatemala. Sí. sí. ¿Y What's por qué viajes a los Estados Unidos? Pues, es que allá no, no tengo terreno, no tengo casa donde vivir. Por esa razón tengo que viajar. Bro. Sí. sí, pero tengo que esperar la voluntad de Dios. Sí. ¿Crees en Dios? Sí, soy cristiano. Sí. ¿Católico soy, o no? No, soy evangélico. Sí, soy, soy evangélico. ¿Y qué, qué, qué quieres hacer aquí en los Estados Unidos? Quiero superar, sacar adelante mi, mi familia. ¿Quieres trabajar? Sí, quiero trabajar. ¿Qué tipo de trabajo quieres Lo que hacer? Sea. Lo que caiga, yo, yo rasque mi vida. Sí. Sí. ¿Tienes una ciudad que quieres ir o no? Lo que sea. Sí. O mi cuñado me va a encontrar allá en Estados Unidos. Sí. ¿Hoy es tu primera vez en los Estados Unidos? Es mi primera vez. ¿Qué piensas? Sí. Está bien duro. Sí, estoy pensando en viajar, I pero... Was, I was my here, but... Lamentablemente salió muy oh, mal el viaje. Va. ¿Qué lo pasó en el viaje? Pues mire, cuántos días, ya llevo un mes de, de, de uh -huh. venir acá. Y pasando en el bus, los bodegos y así está pasando también. Y aquí no hay comida, no hay nada. Sí. ¿Cuántos eh, días fue tu viaje? 30 días. Me lleva 30 días ahorita, un mes cabal. Sí. ¿Fue caro? Sí. Oh, yeah. sí. ¿Cuánto yeah. cuesta para todo? ¿Cómo así? ¿Cuánto cuesta para usted viajar? Como 100 mil. Uh -huh. Sí, 100 mil me están cobrando. 
ejemplo, yo sí. Sería... Y como para pagar es, si no, si no me voy. ¿Fue peligroso? Sí, fue peligroso. ¿Por qué? Porque nos bueno, venimos de escondido. Sí. Sí, este es que la gente americana está bien. Sí, sí, está un poco bien, pero no, pongamos uno, si, si va a encontrar uno, lo matan porque no lo conozca uno. Midway through my interview with Miguel Yate, I began to put two and two together. When Miguel referred to having to hide a lot while crossing the border, he wasn't referring to coyotes. He may have been referring to one of the many civilian border militias that often lurk the perimeter of the border fence. The local sheriff does not welcome their presence on Arizona's border with Mexico, but they say they're not breaking. Wait, 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 wait. There's actual... Wait, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Uh, okay, there's actual people that hunt down people who are crossing the border. Border? I did not know about this or I totally forgot about this. What? Breaking the law. In many documented cases, the these militia groups are alleged to have opened fire indiscriminately on migrants crossing the border fence illegally. Sí. ¿Tienes familia o amigos aquí? Wow. No, no tengo. Vengo solo. No tengo nada. ¿Solo? Solo. Solo vengo. ¿Vas a hacer asilo político? Eh, sí. Uh, ¿es, ¿Es fácil para hacer eso? Pues no sé, fíjate. Me concedo un trabajo, ¿va? Me voy con usted. Necesito recuperar mi, mi familia. Más seguro. ¿Tienes una esposa? Sí, tengo. Sí. sí, por eso tengo que salir. ¿Qué tipo de trabajo te gusta? Pues lo que hay. Lo que hay, yo voy a trabajar. Lo, lo que sea. Sí, sí, voy a hacer. Voy a hacer. ¿Puedes hablar inglés? No, no, no puedo. No, solo español. Pero puedes decir cosas como hello en inglés, ¿sí? Puede ser, sí, aprendiendo. ¿Hay mucha claro, gente, gente de pobreza en Guatemala? Bien, hay. ¿Y cuando tú fuiste joven, fue po pobreza también? Sí, por mi pobreza. No tengo casa, no tengo terreno. Es la misma. Por eso tengo que ir a, a ganar dinero para superar mi familia. ¿Dónde vive en tu familia ahora, en una casa? Pues en un, solo tengo, tenemos prestado una casa nada más. ¿Hay mucha violencia en Guatemala? Pues la verdad que no hay. Uh -huh. Solo pobreza, que no hay dinero, no hay trabajo, pues, sí. ¿Qué es tu sueño para tu vida? Mi sueño, pues, eh, regreso un día, compro mi autobús o mi carro a comprar mi terreno y a construir mi casa. Sí. Sí. Soon after our conversation, Miguel's name was called, and he, along with hundreds of other migrants, began gathering in a single file line to board commuter buses, which were told leave the migrant processing center at 6.30 p.m. sharp every day. Groups of 40 to 50 people, often called micro caravans, began emerging and heading toward the bus to get a good place in line. Hola, bienvenidos, ¿cómo estás? ¿A dónde eres? De México. ¿Cuántos días fue, fue tu vieja? Dos días ya. ¿Estás bien? Sí, algo cansados, pero... ¿Asilo aquí? No sé. Sí, asilo político, por, ahora sí que por problemas de, de la comunidad y algo que le pasa a mí. Se meten mucho la gente mala con los niños, entonces de verdad pues yo quisiera que me apoyaran para sacar a mi hijo porque yo no quiero que mi hijo le hagan ningún daño. Pues ahí sí yo preferiría algo como de cocina o en alguna casa, a limpieza. Sí. Me he costado llegar hasta no, aquí y batallándole con mi hijo. ¿Y qué ciudad prefieres? Prescovalle, Arizona. Ok. Oh, sí. Muy cerca. Sí. ¿Quieres decir una cosa para los americanos? Pues que mm, nos apoyen y ahora sí que nos vean con buena cara porque pues yo pienso que todos merecemos algo mejor, ¿no? Sí. Good luck, guys. After our brief interview, the mother and her son headed to the bus line. And to my surprise, more and more migrants began emerging from all angles headed toward the bus. I wanted to speak to some more people about what their journey was like Whether and arrived. what sort of life they expect in the United States. But it seemed like the commuter bus was probably reaching its maximum capacity yeah. given the amount of yeah, people I saw gathered nearby. So I yeah. figured the best place to continue doing interviews was actually in line, where Border Patrol agents were checking migrants' passports and photographing them for documentation purposes. Despite a gentleman's earlier claim that we have no idea who these people are because they shed all of their ID after hopping the border wall. What they do is when they come through the wall, they shed any type of ID. No one has any idea 
of who these people are. Almost what? everybody in line had valid passports and documentation. Oh, like you try to bribe them with the money, five bucks? Damn. This pair of cousins who came directly from Guatemala and initially told me they left because of well, violence like and extortions. ¿Qué tipo de violencia? Se le digo extorsiones. Ok. Extorsiones. ¿Y ustedes tienen familia aquí? Sí, mis hijos están acá, en Los Ángeles, California. ¿Tus hijos están aquí? Sí. ¿Cuánto? Yo vengo luchando por estar con ellos. E intenté dos veces, pero nada más me hicieron un retiro. ¿Cuántos años tienen tus hijos? El primero tiene 21, la segunda 17 y el okay. chiquito 12. Sí. ¿Y qué, tip, qué tipo de trabajo quieres hacer? Pues a mí me encanta trabajar en casa, casa. en restaurante y cuidar niños, ¿saben? ¿Es difícil para cruzar la frontera aquí? Sí. ¿Fue caro o no? Pues la verdad que como venimos así viajando nosotros por nuestra propia cuenta, pero sí, 18. ¿Cada persona? Sí. ¿Piensas que América es una tierra de oportunidad? Sí, la verdad que sí, no queda sí. la menor duda. Sí. sí. ¿Por uh -huh. qué? Porque nos da oportunidad de trabajar y o sea, ganar mejor que en nuestro país. Sí. I mean, I will say this, uh, to get a job right now is a lot easier, especially physical labor, because right now all the jobs are like, how to do it online stuff? Are being taken over like crazy, but physical jobs like restaurants and like housekeeping or construction work are like open, open right now. Not maybe not in every single area, but like in California, yeah, like a lot of a lot of people are just doing a lot of like at home jobs as much as they can. Por eso sale de nuestra tierra uno los abandona, pero es por algo bueno para apoyarlos. Tus padres son en Guatemala. Sí. I began to learn that it wasn't necessarily safety or quality of life that made America a better choice than Central America. You're actually much more likely to become a victim of property crime in somewhere like Detroit, New Orleans, Baltimore, or even San Francisco than you are in rural Honduras or Guatemala. It more has to do with our minimum wage and the dramatically inflated value of the U.S. dollar in developing nations. For some perspective on just how lopsided our economies are, let's use the standard 9 to 5 American work week as a measurement unit. So that's eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, totaling 40 hours of work every week. With our federal minimum wage, which is about $7.25 an hour, that would mean the average American minimum here is, I think here I could get 12 to $15 an hour. Wage worker makes 290 US dollars per week before taxes. If you work that same job in Guatemala City, under the minimum wage that they set, which is weekly, not hourly, you make 846 quetzales a week, which is about 108 US dollars. Meaning, even if you're making the bare minimum in America, washing dishes, picking berries, or cleaning houses, you'd still be making triple what you'd make in Guatemala or Honduras working the exact same job. It's almost common sense for a lot of these migrants to enter America, work as hard as they can, save up a bunch of money, and then go live a nice life back in their home country. And on a domestic level, it's actually happening in America, especially on the West Coast. Due to the skyrocketing cost of living, absurdly high tax rates, and overall mismanagement of California. The LAO said lawmakers and the governor should consider billions in cuts to programs, including those related to education, the environment, and transportation. Hundreds of thousands of upper income Californians, especially those working in the tech sector, or stay at home remote work. This is, oh, he just said it right there, stay at home remote work has gone up, right? Work has become the norm. Have fled this. What did I fucking tell you, man? Oh, what did I tell you? Sorry. Um, yeah. It's, it costs a lot of money to live in California. Stay at home jobs have gone up like crazy. So there is a lot more physical jobs out there. So that's, I guess you could say good news. I don't know. Um, yeah, man, it, it, it's. The, the whole pandemic, man, really ruined a lot of, like, kind of, like, the workforce, I guess you could say, in my opinion. State and mass to reside elsewhere in states like Arizona, Idaho, Montana, and of course, Texas, where the cost of living is significantly lower and the tax codes are much more relaxed. Three big names in tech are all packing for Texas. It has to do with taxes. The states that have been winning more recently are the states that don't have uh, any state income tax or corporate taxes. This mass exodus of Californians has disrupted the economies and political landscapes of many of these states, causing many Texans to adopt slogans like Don't California My Texas, which refers to the progressive political views often held by California's economic migrants, who are, of course, seeking tax havens in red states. Texas 
doesn't want you. Politics aside, these migrations have been successful in saving Californians a ton of money in the long run. To be honest, I personally moved to Texas, where the cost of living is significantly lower and the tax codes are much more relaxed. Three big names in tech are all packing for oh, Texas. It has to do with taxes. The states that have been winning more recently are the states that don't have uh, any state income tax or corporate taxes. This mass exodus of Californians has disrupted the economies and political landscapes of many of these states, causing many Texans to adopt slogans like Don't California My Texas, which refers to the progressive political views often held by California's economic migrants, who are, of course, seeking tax havens in red states. Texas doesn't want you. Politics aside, these migrations have been successful in saving Californians a ton of money in the long run. To be honest, I personally moved out of California for economic purposes as well, to save money and to be able to provide my family with a higher standard of living. And I wasn't fleeing any kind of danger or poverty. So aside from being a federally tax-paying citizen, what's the difference between me and someone immigrating illegally? It almost feels like they have more of a right to immigrate to America than I do to a red state. It's not my job whether to say that illegal immigration is right or wrong, but I'm just saying from a market like hustle standpoint, it makes perfect sense, especially if the border is wide open like it is now. Anyways, as the buses prepared to leave, a final group of stragglers arrived speaking Bengali. They said they were from Bangladesh. I've never met anybody from Bangladesh, except a taxi driver in New York City six years ago who told me that the traffic in Bangladesh's capital city, Dhaka, was so bad it drove him into a suicidal state of depression, prompting a permanent exodus from his home country. I wanted to interview these migrants, but unfortunately, I don't speak a word of Bengali yet. Still, that didn't stop me. But bear in mind, as you watch this, that I have no idea what they're saying. Mohammed comes from Pabna district, a majority Muslim city of 3 million just west of the capital. I LDP 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 this is all very, very interesting. Muhammad is a member of the Liberal Democratic Party in Bangladesh, a group led by Oli Ahmed, a revolutionary who was the first Bengali military official to revolt against the occupying Pakistani forces in 1971. This led to the Bangladesh Liberation War, in which Bangladesh came out on top and won their sovereignty. Oli Ahmed's party, the LDP, is allied with the even more powerful Bangladesh Nationalist Party, or the BNP, who in the past two decades have been extremely active in their resistance to the current Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's organization, which is called the Awami League. Since Sheikh Hasina came into power in 2009, the BNP and the LDP, which Mohammed belongs to, have accused the Awami League of rigging the elections and fixing the ballots to keep Sheikh Hasina in power, leading to mass protests and in some cases, political violence, especially during the elections of 2018. The opposition activists staged a protest in Dhaka. Oh they God. wore black gags over their mouths to condemn the election. Police fired rubber bullets and tear gas to disperse stone-throwing opposition crowds blocking major intersection roads in the capital, Dhaka. Many opposition activists and leaders were beaten up by the police and hundreds were detained. The opposition blames the government for the crackdown. The government said the programs by opposition parties are intended to destabilize the country and make people suffer. After the 2018 election, tensions continued to escalate between the Awami League and BNP, leading to the arrest and imprisonment of opposition bloggers, teachers, activists, and journalists associated with the BNP. It's more than 20,000 opposition leaders, activists, and supporters have been arrested since late October. Last October, just months before the election polls opened, Sheikh Hasina took things a step further, declaring the opposition party to be a terrorist organization and calling for the immediate arrest of any and all public BNP or LDP members, including Mohammed. Oh, 
एक दिन आगे निर्वाचन हो जाए वा चाय ना हेल डिपी पार्टी करी हमें खाली जीवन रक्षार जो ये देशे चले आसराष्ट्र एक स्वाधीन देश ये देशे आसले हमार जीवन बाजे से मोटामुटी ढाका बनर बसाय आश्रय हमार बनर बसा ढाका मिरपुर से आश्रय नहीं चाय खाली हमर क्षमत थकि स्वाधीन को स्वाधीन साले बांगलेश त्याग करी त्याग कर ये स्वाधीन देश जुक्तरज्य हमार खूब भलो लागे बीस तारीखे मेक्सिको ढुकी के मेक्सिको ढुकी और अमेरिका आज के ऊनत्रिस तारीखे अमेरिका ढुकसी हमार वाइफर कथा तुम जीवन बाचाओ हमार कथा तुम जीवन बाचाओ हमें जो जीवन आज जो बांगलेश ना आसतम तेल थैंक यू मैन आई एप्रिसिएट यू थैंक सो माच टू माई सरप्राइज द बस इज स्टिल हैड एंड लेफ्ट येट सो थैंकफुली दिस जेनलमैन वॉज एबल टू गेट ए सीट I knew from watching the news in previous weeks that these buses were a major source of controversy when it came to the border issue. As indicated by their Texas license plates, these buses were funded by Governor Greg Abbott, who in the past two and a half months has sent over 75,000 migrants from Texas and other states into six sanctuary cities, notably New York City and Chicago, whose immigration and housing resources are being dramatically exhausted by these buses. So this is kind of the famous buses that I've been, you know, hearing about in the news. As you can see, this big ass charter bus just pulled up with Texas license plates. And right as it pulled up, they divided everybody into two lines. They're just going to load everybody up on these buses. I'm not sure where they're going to go, but yeah, this is a, it's bus time, baby. I decided to commit wholeheartedly to following this bus to wherever it would go, which I should note is not illegal given that I'm a member of the press. The bus began on Puerto Blanco Drive and drove eastbound back toward Arizona State Highway 85, a two-lane road that crosses directly into Mexico where it becomes Mexican Highway 8. For reference, that's where we filmed the initial episode in this series, Arizona Border Crisis. We followed this bus for several hours, past multiple border patrol checkpoints, and ultimately onto an Indian reservation called the Tohono O'odham Nation, home to a highly sovereign Native American tribe that owns a 75-mile stretch of the U.S.-Mexico border much of which has no border wall. For this reason, the Tohono O'odham Nation is a hotbed of human trafficking and drug smuggling. Everywhere you look, there are signs for missing women. And the Department of Homeland Security has created a tactical patrol unit called the Shadow Wolves, comprised of military-aged Native American men from the tribe who use ancient tracking techniques to stalk drug smugglers through the desert. As we followed the migrant bus through the res, it abruptly made a left turn down a dirt road. Okay, so we just followed this migrant bus all the way from the border in Lukeville, about 120 miles inland, and now we are at an airport. It's a regional small airport. And parked horizontally in front of us. From out of nowhere, a helicopter landed directly next to our car, and then tribal police came in from the dirt road, blocking us in, and then told us that we were not allowed to film on the Tohono O'odham Nation land unless we got a written permit from the tribal council. And since the tribal council wouldn't be in office until 9 a.m. the next morning, that meant we had to stop filming. The tribal officers were quite courteous with us, but still insisted that we leave and escorted us away. If there's concern about that, obviously we're concerned as well. We have uh, people out here who are following federal agents. All right, well, I appreciate you guys' cooperation. Yeah. Now, yeah, thank you for doing the story you're doing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. The tribal police escorted us off the property and we drove in the direction of Tucson. They followed us the entire way until we left the res. This left me with many questions. Seeing the tribal police obviously collude with the federal government to directly keep me away from documenting whatever they were doing was quite strange. And my mind ran wild with conspiracy theories about what the heck they were hiding. I realized at that point that I was only getting a small part of the picture just speaking with migrants who had immediately crossed the border into the US. It seemed like the group really calling the shots and pulling the strings were the coyotes, who appeared to be playing our broken immigration system like a fiddle and probably making billions every month. And so my new journalistic mission began. I began to ask different migrants and other people involved in that whole world if they knew any coyote who, who would go on camera and give me a full tour of their operations. Oh, At first I thought, this is going to be impossible. What kind of coyote would want to go on camera? <laughs> But I learned that most coyotes actually see themselves as Harriet Tubman-style freedom fighters, transporting the poor and needy up north for a better life. 
and so I got in touch with some coyotes who said they wanted a chance to explain themselves to the world. I mean, if they were, wouldn't they charge them less? I understand charging them because it costs money to get to one place to another. I understand to that extent, but wouldn't they over, not overcharge? But there was one problem. They weren't anywhere near Arizona. They were in a city called Piedras Negras, which is directly across the Texas border from a town Black called Eagle Pass, Rock. Texas, a town of about 28,000 people that in the past couple months has seen more illegal immigration than any other city on the entire border. On Wednesday, Border Patrol agents apprehended more than 10,000 migrants. <laughs> Scenes like these have happened too often in the last month, making Maverick County the deadliest area for migrants in this 10 county border region. And so I caught a flight to San Antonio, rented a car and drove to Eagle Pass. At first, I asked the coyotes if they could walk over the border and meet me in the United States. But they said that was way too sketchy. So I enlisted local rapper Chad Blanco to escort me across the border. Oh, I keep me a strap on my lap and a strap in the back. Right away 20 bags of the gas in the trunk, got to serve like the whole Eagle Pass. So we're going to go into Mexico. Uh, we're gonna meet up with a coyote, professional coyote. Coyote's gonna be uh, the person that crosses you. So the person that's, you know, a trained person to go through the desert, go through the river, uh, get, get you to your pickup over here in, in the United oh, yeah. States, so. If you wanna see our new Patreon. episode, Texas border crisis, go to our Patreon, www.patreon.com slash channel five. As many of you know, channel five is, has always been, and will continue to be completely independent and powered 100% by your contributions of five dollars oh so you guys want to get to see it early looks like it's on patreon but or at all let me know you're still going to yeah damn dude saludos desde tierra mira su abuela saludos saludos para piedras channel 5 live bro how oh, man the dedication on this dude that's insane, man. It's amazing that I've learned more about the system from your videos than anything else in the media. Part because you are a terrific job. Great questions. Uh, doing interviews, even when you wouldn't understand what he was saying, but still giving a voice, incredible stuff. Yeah, because then like you could just translate it later on, right? Crazy, though. This heads up when the Sinhalese man is talking about the difficulty to manifest our problem as... What you're meaning is, isn't manifest change, but rally to enable to protest and trust known as manifestation. I... God generally just uh, the best around the planet. This is real journalism. Andrew's Spanish is on point. I don't know. I'm very surprised how, how good your Spanish is, but better than mine was. <laughs> uh, they are totally unaware of the current situation in reality. It takes years to get a work permit and start working to file for asylum. Asylum. Uh, you need to have a lawyer and will cost you a lot of money even to move in the US. The struggle will not end. Um that is true, but also there's such thing as pay under the table too as well. And a lot of like workers do prefer to pay under the table because they save money on ta on like taxes or something like that. And they don't have to pay you as much too as well, by the way. They don't have to pay you as much. I wonder if somebody said that. They know what's to come, that's why they work under the table. That's, yeah, they still do that. The under table stuff, cause they don't have to pay them as much, and they save a lot. They save money on that. Uh, but yeah, there's no benefits or uh, insurance. Obviously, taxes, all that. Like, yeah, you don't get any of that. Um, but yeah, there is a lease. Uh, they do get paid on the table, cause the 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 last job I worked on, they they want to do under the table thing only. You, you, I was like, all right, I guess. Like, that's weird, but all right. <laughs> like, I would not uh protest, you know? <laughs> like, that's what you guys want to do. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, man, his videos are insane lately, dude. In the past, what, month? Yeah, within like, hold up. Yeah, within one month, he did harm reduction felicity, felicity, uh, felicity, sorry, Philly Streets, Arizona border, Kirkmac, and then boom, all the uh the migrated detention camp, man, that's insane. But then again, all this was like done within like I guess like some of his break, I guess you could say. I don't know, but uh, yeah. Insane work, man. Insane work.